risk. Dr. Francis Rito is an infectious disease specialist on the front line of the war on coronavirus. From the first confirmed COVID-19 death in the U.S., Rito and Evergreen Health in Kirkland, Washington, are now at the forefront of finding a treatment. They're taking part in a clinical trial of remdesivir. This is an intravenous medication. It's given for 10 days. After it was administered to the sickest COVID-19 patients, Dr. Rito says it showed real promise, and that was just phase one of the trial. When you go into a second phase of the trial, what does that mean? So the second phase is going to use this as the backbone. So every patient will receive remdesivir because the first trial, Act 1, uh, showed benefit, shortened the course of illness, and uh, almost statistically significantly showed a decrease in mortality. In phase two, some patients will also get a companion drug called baricitinib, which is used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. But every COVID-19 patient in the trial will now be treated with remdesivir. Why is that a big deal? That's huge. This is the first scientifically proven beneficial drug in terms of the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. Trials of the drug are happening across 68 sites. More than a thousand people have taken part. The result? Patients recovered 31 percent more quickly with remdesivir. That translates to four fewer days of suffering in the hospital. Although a 31 percent improvement doesn't seem like a knockout 100 percent, it is a very important proof of concept because what it is proven is that a drug can block this virus. Remdesivir was originally created as a potential drug to treat Ebola. Dr. Rito was also on the front lines of that battle, traveling to Africa. He hopes the drug works this time around. But before this second trial was done, the president, alongside the CEO of Gilead, who makes the drug, announced the FDA's emergency use authorization for remdesivir. We'll be working with the government to determine how best to uh, uh, distribute that uh, within the United States. The FDA acting unusually quickly. For now, the drug is being used only in hospitals on the sickest COVID-19 patients. It is not a cure. Some of the patients treated with the drug still died, but others felt better, faster. So this could be one major tool in the fight against coronavirus. Correct. Just the pressure that is felt by these frontline medical workers. We've heard the story, so many of them separated from their loved ones for long periods of time. They can't go home working long hours, trying to get the personal protective equipment they need, and then being around so much death and suffering, it has to wear you down. Yeah, no, no question, John. I mean, even, even outside of a pandemic, I mean, you're talking about a, a vulnerable population of people. I mean. Um, you know, death by suicide among the medical community is higher than the general population and within EMTs and emergency workers, it's, it's the highest even among medical workers. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of stress. I think there was a lot of unfamiliar roles as well. A lot of times as, as challenging as the roles can be um, for EMTs in particular and ER doctors, um, there is still a, 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 a pattern to things like how you get things done, how you sort of work your way through problems. When you're dealing with things that are completely new, unfamiliar, that can be really challenging. I heard that from a lot of my colleagues. Uh, I think that the lack of personal protective equipment, I mean, you know, we, we, talked a lot of, we talked a lot about that. We still talk about it. Significant psychological toll of that as well, not just for themselves uh, in terms of am I, am I safe? Did I contract the virus? Was I just exposed? Uh, but then, as you mentioned, John, then going home, potentially uh, exposing it to others. And then just the, just the hours, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, to hear um, Dr. Breen's story and her father sort of talk about it, I mean, just, they, were, they were just toxically tired after a while in, in terms of being able to deal with these things. So who knows? I mean, the, it's always such a personal sort of thing and, you know, it's tragic. And, but, but I think these are some of the things that you're hearing from these, these frontline workers.
Um, John, you know, you write that this virus will likely keep spreading for 18 months to two years. And the forecast that, that you both put in there was until 60 to 70 percent of the population worldwide has it, which I know Mark has said earlier on this program is sort of how he defines herd immunity. You warn, though, that this could include a second big wave of coronavirus infections in the fall and winter. So the question to you, John, when you look at these numbers is, is could that wave be bigger than what we are seeing right now? It could be. Uh, you know, what we've seen so far has been controlled and, and lessened significantly by the actions we've taken. Uh, if those actions are released and people stop paying attention to social distancing, uh, you need to, even if, if we end lockdown, you still have to continue social distancing and other public health uh, measures. Uh, it could get considerably worse than what we've seen so far. A pretty sobering, a pretty sobering warning. I mean, Mark, you know, the virus has been spreading at least for about five months from what we understand. So far, according to official numbers, less than 1% of the world's population has been infected. Now, obviously, that number is, is going to be much higher than that, but it, it, it's still going to be pretty low as a percent of the global population. So to get to 60 to 70% in two years, just does that mean a huge acceleration at some point in your modeling, Mark? Yeah, well, I think, the, of course, you can't get from 5% in a few months to 70% uh, without, uh, without a lot more cases uh, than we've had up till now. And so that would mean a bigger wave. If we keep it under control with really intense control measures, we might not get to 50 or 70% uh, by that time, but then we will still have uh, either the need for a vaccine or a uh, a population that's still still susceptible.